we have, um, I'm sure, a bunch of feminists out there also connecting and, and also um, I'm sure will send a lot of messages. So um, as you can see, uh, the title is very provocative. Feminists are also looking at this uh, process of, a, of the conversation for a binding treaty. And um, the conversations about the impact of transnationals and, and business and corporate power against human rights, it's not new, right? Um, as we have seen in many sessions uh, during these days, it's not new, but it's, uh, it's really gaining a lot of momentum. And there is a lot of evidence that many organizations here uh, have been gathering. For instance, uh, early in the morning, we had a session with Poder, Prodesk, uh, and also Mexico was present there where they talked about the pollution scandal of Rio Sonora, where more than 25,000 uh, are still awaiting justice. Um, also, uh, the erosion of women's workers', workers rights. Um, a group of, you know, of, um, of our allies in this process, the World March of Women, couldn't come, for instance, this time to the Human Rights Council because they are doing a lot of actions around the Rana Plaza uh, incident in Bangladesh uh, four years ago where more than uh, 1,000 workers, mainly women, were killed um, given the poor uh, and precarious working conditions. And also uh, many of, of, of you know about uh, the constant persecution and criminalization of human rights defenders, especially environmentalist uh, activists uh, are being persecuted. We, we, our dear Berta Cáceres from Honduras uh, was killed um, a year ago in, in March. And so these are also pieces of evidence that tell us about, you know, this impact of transnational and corporate power beyond also the, the tax avoidance. But this is part of the story. We also have the story of how uh, corporate power and business are also gaining a lot of political power, how they are also sitting at the table of international debates. Many of us uh, who have been following the process of um, the negotiation around the sustainable development goals have been uh, seeing increasing the role of um, the, the private sector sitting at the table with states. Um, and when we look at you know, the size of this, uh, of this private sector, uh, very recently, AWID uh, launched a, a publication where we, fi we, we identified that the 63% of the most powerful economic entities are actually transnational corporations, and only 30, 30, 37 are states. So this means this is the size of the beast, right? And this means that we really need to unpack, you know, what this is, what this unregulated power means to achieve, uh, to achieve justice. So um, when we look at the Agenda 2030 that is also mentioned here at the Human Rights Council, and we hear words like um, um, meaningful multi-stakeholder partnership, when we hear words like public-private partnership, when we hear about you know, new partnerships with the private sector, this is a way of, you know, mentioning the ways in which the private sector is entering and influencing public policies, influencing uh, development, influencing the realities and the lives of people. Um, but this is also not the whole story. Uh, fortunately, civil society uh, has not remained silent. Civil society has been organized and mobilized for years. And parts of these stories are an, an analysis and resistance um, will be shared here in this panel. Um, uh, AWID and Poder and WILF and FIDH have put together this panel, so I'm going to introduce. Um, on, my, on my left, I have um, Andrea Bolaños from Central America, Plataforma Internacional Contra la Impunidad. Fernanda Oppenheim from Mexico Poder. On the other corner is my colleague, Ina Micaeli from AWID, and um, Maria Muñoz from WILF, from Spain. And we are also honored to have here Luis Espinosa Salas 
from the permanent mission of Ecuador to the UN in Geneva, who will be, you know, um, silently for a moment <laughs> listening to, uh, you know, these stories, the experience, the visions from feminists, from women's rights organizations. And, and then giving us uh, a little bit of, you know, the background and the, and the intelligence of what is going on around this new um, process around the UN binding treaty. So my question to you all uh, is, uh, what are the, the what is, has been the impact, you know, from, from your experience about how this is the power of the corporates uh, and business uh, is affecting the lives of women uh, from your work, from the, the organizations, the work that you do. Andrea, do you want to go first? Indígenas y para las mujeres indígenas está en un desbalance de poderes. 
El otro es el problema de acceso geográfico. Por lo menos en Guatemala, y imagino que para muchos países también, el los tribunales están y los juzgados están en las cabeceras municipales. Muchas comunidades indígenas están en zonas rurales, por lo cual el desplazamiento de las zonas rurales a las cabeceras municipales, tanto para interponer demandas como para seguir los casos que tienen en su contra, son, eh, tienen altos costos de tiempo y económicos. Y les digo de tiempo, ¿por qué? Y es porque los, los, los pueblos indígenas trabajan en la tierra y un día de jornal les equivale a ellos un día de comer. Y entonces esto tenemos que tenerlo muy presente. Además, impacta económicamente para, para poder pagar transporte, para poder pagar alojamiento en las cabeceras municipales y sobre todo para poder pagar un abogado que les asista. Ese es otro gran problema que enfrentan las comunidades y las mujeres indígenas, y es contar con la asistencia jurídica que pueda proveerles defensa o que pueda seguir los casos que ellas presentan. Eh, otro punto es el acceso a la justicia en su propio idioma. Por lo menos en Guatemala hay 22 idiomas mayas, y no, desafortunadamente el sistema judicial no cuenta con traductores para todas las lenguas. Entonces, muchas mujeres que quieren acceder a la justicia vuelvo y repito, o en su defensa o para interpelar demandas, están sometidas a un sistema de justicia que no habla su idioma, en donde ellas no pueden expresarse en su idioma materno y en donde además no existen traductores para ser atendidas sus demandas. El otro punto, y ya con esto voy cerrando, son las medidas de seguridad. Muchos territorios en donde se están adelantando megaproyectos han sido militarizados, bien sea por seguridad privada o bien sea por eh, el ejército y la fuerza pública estatal que les sirve a los intereses de las empresas privadas. Entonces, esta militarización también tiene el objetivo de controlar el quehacer de las mujeres líderes indígenas. Eh, esto las limita, esto las pone en obviamente una cuestión de seguridad muy alta eh, que hace que muchas veces eh, desestimen sus demandas o no puedan seguir con los procesos judiciales para, eh, no, para poder protegerse. Eh, quiero hablar específicamente de las mujeres indígenas ya para cerrar. Muchas mujeres indígenas que están siendo criminalizadas, por ejemplo, en el municipio de Santa Eulalia, en Huehuetenango, que es una región bastante apartada de la cabecera municipal del municipio, del departamento, que se llama también Huehuetenango, están siendo criminalizadas en este momento por demandas interpuestas por las empresas que están operando las hidroeléctricas en, en, en esta zona. Estas mujeres están siendo no solamente criminalizadas por delitos que ellas no han cometido, sino que además están siendo, eh, el, tienen un discurso, se están entablando un discurso por parte de, de, de las empresas de que las mujeres mejor tienen que estar en la casa, de que para qué se ponen ellas a liderar eh, protestas en contra de las emprendimientos, en, entre los, eh, en contra de, las, de los megaproyectos si el rol de la mujer es estar en la casa cuidando a los niños y proveyendo la, el alimento. Por supuesto, en sociedades todavía machistas, este discurso cala. Y las mujeres ya no solo son estigmatizadas por su liderazgo, frente, o sea, son estigmatizadas en su liderazgo frente a las comunidades y también por el otro lado siendo procesadas penalmente por un crimen que no cometen. Esto les pone una doble carga eh, a las mujeres. Mm. Gracias, eh, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. I, I think that uh, it's very important, you know, that uh, we bring the perspective of indigenous women and indigenous peoples into the, into the treaty discussions. And I think that it resonates, right, with the women human rights defenders perspective and Ewitt's analysis on that. Ina? Thank you, Alejandra. Um, corporate human rights abuse is gendered in its impacting form, both in relation to communities and to defenders of human rights. I will speak to some of these aspects and reflect on the architecture of corporate impunity and the context in which women human rights defenders operate, because this is precisely the context that we aim to urgently transform with our engagement towards the binding treaty on transnational corporations and human rights. Um, two years ago, AWID and the Women Human Rights uh, Defenders International Coalition embarked on a participatory research project 
with Women Human Rights Defenders from 22 countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa confronting extractive industries. Um, one of the products of this research process is a report that you can uh, download on a website. This is, you can see it in my hand. Um, why focus on extractive industries? Um, last year, in his report, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders uh, noted that out of 156 killings of human rights defenders in 2015, 45% were of defenders of environmental, land, and indigenous rights. So environmental struggles are the most lethal for human rights defenders, and in that, extractive industries, um, mining, um, hydroelectric projects, and so on, are the most lethal for human rights defenders. Now, we know that women are disproportionately uh, affected by corporate human rights abuse. Um, we know, for example, the displacement of communities, environmental degradation, um, um, pollution and contamination of um, land and water all harm women in particular ways. However, impact on women human rights defenders is also gender specific, both for their human rights work and for their gender identity and I would like to give you some examples. Um, one example um, is criminalization of um, women human rights defenders. So this is an example of how these um, violations impact all human rights defenders, but women human rights defenders experience uh, particular hardships. So for example, women uh, due to economic marginalization and limited access to resources might have more difficulty to raise bail money. When they are uh, primary caretakers in their families, arrest and detention would involve additional hardship. Another example is stigmatization. Human rights defenders are being stigmatized as anti-patriotic, anti-development, and even terrorist. But for women human rights defenders, this, al this is also sexual and gender stigmatization using patriarchal social conceptions about women's sexuality in gender roles to stigmatize them as sexually promiscuous or as bad mothers. So as Andrea said, what are they doing out there instead of being at home? <laughs> uh, militarization is a major problem as private security and paramilitary companies um, as well as military and the police um, in occasions of state and company agreements uh, that dispatch these public security forces to protect corporate interests against the citizens that are actually paying the taxes um, that sustain this um, public uh, security. Um, we're speaking of rape and sexual violence by security personnel, but also about general um, impact of militarization on society that strengthens values and practices of physical violence, gender-based violence, uh, and, um, and patriarchy. Um, one last example, women human rights defenders also report that when community consultations and negotiations take place, women are often excluded altogether. Now, women may be excluded from leadership structure in their own community, and they may have may struggle to have a voice and representation, but we see in our research that even when women are recognized as leaders in their communities, state authorities and companies may not recognize them as such and may exclude them. Um, so this overall context of corporate impunity and um, uh, that we are talking about, and I would like to specifically consider the practices that abuse human rights standards and achievements because it's central to the violations on the ground that we seek to address. So let's just take as one example, the demand for consultation, from which, as I mentioned, women are often excluded, and for free, prior, and informed consent of affected communities. Many companies don't comply, but some do. However, this compliance is not necessarily genuine or meaningful. And communities do not actually um, always have the power to exercise in this process. On the contrary, evidence suggests that many companies understand the requirement for free, prior, and informed consent as a checkbox 
and actually as an invitation to extort this consent through legal and illegal means avoidable from bribery to compelling people to sign consent documents at gunpoint. And this evidence is systematic. These are not occasional offenders. Um, similar trends have been traced worldwide, most recently in a report published in April by Inclusive Development International and Partners, um, examining the loans of the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector lending arm of the World Bank, that in fact has the mission to reduce poverty. Clearly, we cannot rely on benevolence of companies, on voluntary um, measures. We also have to take into account corporate capture of political processes on national and international level. Um, corporate capture is a topic that has been addressed even in some of the events mm. here um, <coughs> this week. Because we are faced with companies repeatedly referring to the responsibility of states, um, and at the same time increasingly um, having more and more power in relation to the state, it's part of the context within which uh, we operate. Um, but from the other side, states um, are also complicit in this process and continue to sign off their powers and responsibilities to the private sector through trade agreements, uh, through bilateral and multilateral contractual engagement, uh, through retirement of financial institutions, and so on. And so we need instruments that acknowledge and respond to this reality rather than ignoring it and repeating the same <coughs> effort of state responsibility. It is not taken. It is um, um, something we are um, struggling to see. Um, it is also in the interest of states to have such instruments in place that would allow the states to respond to the re uh, requests of the citizens and communities uh, with regard to their rights and particularly around land and territory without having the financial threat presented currently by mechanisms like the state investor settlement dispute system, the ISDS, where companies can take state support but they don't have parallel processes to do, um, to do um, this um, in the other direction. And finally, um, what I would like to say, and this is also from our research, is that women human rights defenders are still resisting. And despite the powers, the enormous powers, state and corporate that they stand against, still women are succeeding in mobilizing communities and at times even blocking extractive projects or uh, pressuring state and company officials to negotiate with them. They work under impossible and intimidating and often life-threatening conditions. Uh, Beata Cáceres, who was mentioned here, is one of the, uh, uh, and who was killed in Honduras last year, was one of the women human rights defenders and indigenous feminists who took part in our research. Um, and as we speak, other women human rights defenders are also at risk. And so our engagement in the treaty is a hope to challenge some of these impossible conditions within which women human rights defenders work. And this is why we hope to see all allies for women's rights, uh, including states, supporting this process. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. Um, and also, you know, uh, as you as you were speaking, um, I was remembering, you know, um, last year when we when feminists, you know, met uh, during the the meeting of the working group uh, for the binding treaty. Another aspect that we tapped was the the impact of uh, the corporate power on women's workers' rights. And so I would like uh, to hear from from Fernanda and from the work uh, of your organization also if you can relate to that. I'm going to be brief, uh, just trying to complete the picture of the different impacts corporate power uh, has on women and women human rights defenders. Um, so I'll just um, point out some of the uh, risks and challenges that women are facing in the workplace. Um, so as you all know, women are disproportionately represented in, in the most insecure, unsafe, lowest paying and unstable forms of employment available in uh, local uh, businesses and, and companies, but mostly in transnational and large corporations. Um, <coughs> not only within their own operations, but in all the, the supply chain. Um, so it's 
taps on the actual responsibilities of the corporations and also with their business partners. Um, uh, so, especially in the informal sectors of, econ of economy, uh, women are overrepresented, uh, and informal workers are unrecognized under national labor, labor legislation. So, they lack basic, uh, basic labor protections and the enjoyment of work related human rights. Um, so, this is a very common practice everywhere in the world, in all regions, and I think this is also something that we should be. Uh, addressing together in this debate. Um, also in some, uh, in the formal sector, employment opportunities for TNCs by transnational corporations generally pay more to men than to women. So we are still facing a very broad gender pay gap. Um, women have less opportunities for advancement within corporations. And this contributes to the entrenchment of gender inequalities because these are also linked to the access to resources within the households and in you know, broader social and economic agency that women should have within societies. Um, and uh, I think that this also impacts particularly women in, let's say, local communities or vulnerable communities, in particular industries focused on exploiting natural resources, such as large scale energy, um, mining, forestry, and also in the agro-industries, and of course in garment manufacturing, as Alejandro was saying, the example of Rana Plaza uh, shows how vulnerable women are in the workplace in, uh, in general, but in some industries in particular. Uh, and let's remember that this, this garment factories are some of the main providers of clothes for you know, the brands we all tend to buy and wear. So this is uh, the responsibility also of, of those companies that are sometimes sitting in those in this international spaces as well and trying to influence the negotiations of different instruments in the United Nations systems and ILO and other spaces. Um, so I also wanted to, to point out um, um, some issues related to violence within the workplace. It, this includes uh, work, uh, harassment in the workplace and sexual harassment in particular towards women. Um, this includes sometimes physical abuse, sexual violence, not only in the workplace but also when traveling to and from work. Uh, and this is especially uh, present in conflict and post-conflict environments. And, and So in those situations women are particularly vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their employers. And, and I think uh, we should also be pointing this, uh, this impact on women uh, to the corporations and also to the states, because generally in lab labor laws protect women in many countries from these situations, but in practice that doesn't happen. It's not being effective and corporate power is, uh, is shown and seen very strongly. Uh, in the fact that it's sometimes inspectors can't even get into the factories to, to look at the working conditions mm -hmm. of women <coughs> and, and to, to control effectively that labor laws are complied with. So um, this is just another example that shows how corporate power uh, has been growing, how laws are not being respected in many cases by corporations or s that states are not strong enough to enforce those laws. So this is one of the additional reasons, uh, together with my, what my colleagues were sharing just a moment ago, that has brought us into the table as, as women's human rights defenders or as feminists, both within women's organization and other organizations uh, where we work together with our male colleagues to, to promote gender equality as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave it there and maybe we can share more on the strategies. Of course. <coughs> so this has been, of course, a very, of course, partial, right, picture. I mean, uh, there, there are many stories out there uh, that can tell more and more about, you know, the, the terrible impact. Um, and I'm sure that uh, all of you here have more to say about, you know, 
all this differentiated impact that is needed. Here we have heard about, you know, indigenous uh, perspectives, the perspective of women human rights defenders, the challenges to, in order to have access to justice, the criminalization, the violence against women, um, the land, the, the expropriation of land, the difficulties to access um, to livelihoods, the violence in the workspace. Um, but also the impunity and the silence, right? Um, and, and, and the collusion of the states in this. So um, all of these, you know, um, tell us a very uh, bad scenario. And as I said at the very beginning, uh, the, the powerful entities are corporates, not the states. So, but at the same time, we're hearing that there is an opportunity right <laughs> maria so can you tell a bit more about you know how uh, this um, uh, this assessment from the feminists uh, uh, resonates with the conversations here in geneva and if you can tell us more about the opportunity of the binding treaty <coughs> thank you very much and uh, um, I'm, i would like to talk about how this has been brought to geneva all of uh, uh, the violations that we've been mentioning, and then also how that can help, what has been gained so far can help for for the binding treaty. First of all, um, my colleagues asked me to, um, to mention that I had difficulties in entering the UN today because I was coming with uh, my little daughter because she doesn't have daycare uh, right now. Um, so that is also one of the barriers that women mm -hmm. uh, face every day. And I wouldn't be fair with myself as a feminist if I didn't mention yeah. it uh, publicly and take this opportunity uh, of speaking publicly to, to say that. Uh, she could get in in the end, but you know, it took a few phone calls and it shouldn't uh, have uh, been that way. Um, so I wanted to mention how uh, these violations, when they have been brought uh, to Geneva, lately we have uh, started bringing them as uh, extraterritorial obligations, violations of the extraterritorial obligations of states. So what does that mean? That means that states, uh, when they sign treaties uh, with uh, our, um, human rights conventions, where they, uh, they have obligations towards, we think usually their own citizens in terms of protection of human rights, that they are also obliged not to violate human rights of people that live abroad. <laughs> and the very clear example that comes to all of uh, your minds is companies uh, coming from states around the world that operate abroad and they violate human rights on those countries. So let's say a German, co a German company operating abroad and abroad violating human rights, is there any responsibility for Germany there? And that is what uh, women have been challenging. Um, and the reason why it was needed to do that is because obviously in, in today's world, if we look at human rights in silos and we all only make each government responsibility for its own citizens or the women that live within its country, we're never going to get there. And I mean, we've, we've tried many times going to the host states, going uh, to uh, the states like Guatemala and asking them to protect the women that live within its borders and we're still doing that. But there is also a responsibility of the country that has been sending those companies and allowing those companies to uh, violate human rights. So that is, that is uh, the legal uh, basis that we have been, uh, and uh, so many women have been bringing to Geneva. And, uh, and at some point it gives us the idea that what the treaty wants to do, the treaty on, on corporations, um, is, you will see it's not going to limit the, the power of, uh, of rich states, let's say, uh, more than it is already, mm -hmm. because you can see that it is already recognized that those states already have obligations toward their, uh, their corporations operating abroad. So this is just going to clarify something that it is already law. It's just a law that somebody, sometimes it's uh, better to ignore for those that are on the rich side. Um, so a few examples that I would like to bring are um, cases that have been brought to CEDO committee, so the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And CEDO committee had established already that states, all states that are part of this convention, have a due diligence obligation. 
that not only the government and the state cannot uh, violate human rights, but also they have to prevent that any private actor within its state is violating human rights against women. Um, so having a basis on this, and uh, we can also mention General Recommendation 28 from that, uh, from that uh, committee that clarifies the obligations uh, in terms of bus business and human rights, um, and, and that specifically mentioned the due diligence of activities of companies operating abroad. Having a basis on that, uh, women have been bringing cases um, to the CEDAW committee. I can mention a few as the strongest examples uh, from CEDAW's point of view. First of all, it was uh, on Sweden. Um, Wilf uh, did a report on Sweden, specifically talking about Bangladesh, a few of the of the elements that have been mentioned here, the unequal pay, also the insecurity both uh, from uh, violence and uh, from accidents as uh, you've, uh, you've just mentioned, the Rana Plaza. Um, and in, in that case, uh, the CEDAW committee mentioned that you know, there's a due diligence. So they said, Sweden, you are, not, uh, you are not complying with your obligations. And it's not because of something that you are, that you are allowing to be done within Sweden, this is because of something that is happening in Bangladesh. They also mentioned how uh, social corporate, uh, corporate responsibility is not working. And they mentioned, you know, the guiding uh, the, the, the national uh, plan within Sweden and, you know, saying you have to see that evidence says that this has not been, it's not working so far. Um, then uh, we also uh, did with the Plataforma uh, Internacional Contra la Impunidad, uh, so uh, also um, uh, here, we uh, talked about Canada. Uh, uh, we elaborated a report on Canada and the impact uh, on women in Guatemala. And this was really about access to justice and a few of the, um, of the, of the violent uh, events and uh, attacks on, on women human rights defenders in Guatemala. Um, and in this case, the committee, again, um, recognized uh, this obligation uh, by Canada. They asked for an independent investigation any time that there is an alleged violation outside of Canada by a Canadian company. Um, and they talked about access to justice. And very interestingly, the CEDAW committee started to talk about gender impact assessment and said, you have, to, uh, you have to ask your companies to do human rights assessment, always when they operate abroad, but to include a gender impact assessment within that. Um, later on, uh, there have been uh, recommendations on Germany. I believe our colleagues from FIAN uh, did a, a report in that, um, in, in that uh, a review of Germany. And again, uh, the CEDAW committee is mentioning gender impact assessment as, uh, as an obligation for companies over operating abroad and the due investigation and independent investigation. And so what we can observe from CEDAW uh, as their, their interpretation of, of the CEDAW convention, which is, you know, it's an, um, it's an interpretation that we need to take into account as an interpretation of international law in general. And it, it's saying, uh, first of all, corporate social responsibility is not working. And, and it's saying you need to have independent investigation of violations, even if they have operated abroad. And you need to uh, be having gender impact assessment. And I believe uh, in the case of Canada, even today, we had news of an independent investigation that has been approved by the Supreme Court uh, that will uh, be taking place. Um, so, you know, um, when we have established uh, these uh, elements, first of all, that extraterritorial obligations are already a reality and that uh, the human rights bodies are considering, and I'm just mentioning CEDAW because this is about women's rights, but there are other committees that have recognized this are already considering that states have obligations that go beyond their borders. Uh, and uh, we, when we have established that the CEDAW committee is asking for, uh, to include a uh, gender sensitive approach as, um, as part of the assessment, human rights assessment that needs to be done, um, I think when it comes to the treaty and how do we translate all of this to what, uh, what uh, should 
be included in this treaty and what this treaty should solve. And first of all, we uh, as will believe that access to justice needs to be an element that needs to take into account women's experience in particular within this treaty. Um, and I think uh, a few colleagues have already mentioned a few and probably will uh, mention uh, how that can be done. Uh, in, in, the, in terms of the remedies, whenever the treaty is looking at remedies, it will need to specifically say that a gender impact assessment of those remedies will need to be done so that we can see that the remedies will actually impact positively the women that have been victim. Of course, the protection of women human rights defenders but most importantly, WILP believes that there will need to be um, an obligation. We, uh, because of the evolution of different laws around the world that we see, we think that it's very probable that when we ask for a gender, uh, for a human rights impact assessment of companies over, uh, operating abroad, abroad, hopefully a very independent and um, an impartial one. And we think that there needs to be specifically <coughs> mentioned that the gender impact assessment will have to be part of that human rights assessment for activities of companies uh, operating abroad. So that is, um, let's say, our uh, contribution that we will be happy to uh, develop further in, in our participation in, in this treaty in which we put uh, so much, so much hope and that we believe will uh, we'll soon be uh, moving forward very considerably. Thank you. Thank you for that positive note, Maria, and I'm, and I'm sure that, uh, that that will be the case. And when I was hearing you about, you know, talking about everything, you know, CEDO, uh, I'm sure that behind those stories and those recommendations, there are a lot, there's a lot of strategizing, right, and networking. And when you mention one organization or the other, it's a lot of history between networks and and trust and education among ourselves. Because everything, you know, here that we say implies a lot of, you know, years of work, years of networking, years of coming to these spaces, but also working on the ground. So my question now uh, to all of you, um, to Ina, to Fernanda, and to Andrea, that has also been strategizing in another room, um, uh, it's to talk a little bit about, you know, one or two examples, maybe stick to one example of a concrete strategy of, you know, uh, how women are addressing this, uh, resisting and, and challenging corporate power, but also if you can also add to what Maria was talking about, the elements, right? What are you proposing uh, from your organization, from a feminist women's rights perspective to, you know, this elaboration of a treaty, a binding treaty on transnational corporations and human rights? Maybe, are you okay? Yeah. Okay, Andrea. Gracias de nuevo. Disculpa, tenía que hacer una intervención oral en la sala 20. Ya estoy de vuelta. <risa> <risa> eh, bueno, eh, las mujeres indígenas en Guatemala, su gran estrategia y por ahora la más fuerte es seguir resistiendo, seguir denunciando tanto a nivel nacional como internacional lo que pasa en sus comunidades. Eh, Jeff, eh, algunas de ellas están, han entablado demandas internacionales en Canadá. There's no translation. Mm -hmm. So maybe someone can translate. Uh, no, but there is, there is translation. Translation? Yeah. Channel, channel, channel two. Channel two. Yeah. Channel two. Yeah. 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 Eh, y aceptó la demanda eh, por una hidroeléctrica canadiense en Guatemala. Eh, sobre el sobre, desde nuestra organización, ¿qué enfoque o qué le estamos eh, sugiriendo o estamos haciendo incidencia para el tratado? Como dije al principio, nosotros estamos convencidos que el tratado debería tener un enfoque de pertinencia étnica, es decir, un reconocimiento a las comunidades indígenas y en eso eh, hacemos insistencia en, la, en las remediaciones o en lo que nosotros llamamos reparaciones en, en español. Unas reparaciones que tengan un enfoque de derechos humanos, que sean consultadas con las víctimas, eh, con las personas indígenas, con sus comunidades, 
que respeten la cosmovisión y la cultura de las comunidades indígenas, eh, que sean colectivas, que tengan un enfoque colectivo, comunitario e individual. Y ahí quiero eh, hacer clara que no es excluyente, sino que se reconozca el carácter colectivo de las comunidades indígenas y su cosmovisión colectiva. Eso no quiere decir que se excluyan reparaciones individuales cuando sea el caso. El otro eh, enfoque que estamos pidiendo en el, en, en el tema de reparaciones es establecer un mecanismo independiente que duele por el cumplimiento de las reparaciones solicitadas y acordadas con las personas. Eh, y por último, un acompañamiento médico y psicosocial, porque los procesos eh, penales y los procesos de búsqueda de justicia, incluso los procesos de reparaciones, son largos son largos y desgastantes individual y colectivamente y hemos visto en la experiencia de Guatemala eh, con varios procesos de reparaciones eh, justamente por hidroeléctricas que las comunidades se desgastan, las mujeres se desgastan y necesitan acompañamiento psicosocial muchas veces ellas lo solicitan desde su cosmovisión y desde sus propias prácticas tradicionales Gracias Andrea Thank you Andrea Um, so I guess one of the strategies, the side of the strategies on the ground where women are resisting every day, uh, it's also uh, you know, networking internationally. So we are confronting transnational powers and we need to be working transnationally. Uh, so one of the things uh, Poder has been doing is participating actively in the, well, we are part of the ESER Net, the International Network on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. I'm part of the steering committee of the Corporate Accountability Working Group and we're trying to build the links between the Corporate Accountability Working Group and the Women and ESCR Working Group, so bringing together both perspectives because uh, uh, surprisingly there's not as many women working in Corporate Accountability. It's growing but historically it hasn't been the case and so I think that that trend is changing and we're trying to make those links. And with and we are actively participating in the Treaty Alliance, this broad international alliance of civil society groups around the world promoting uh, the binding treaty. Um, so we submitted some very concrete um, recommendations and inputs for the Intergovernmental Working Group second session in 2016, last year in October. And I'm just gonna go, it's just four, I'm gonna read them so I'm precise related to you know gender equality and women in particular. We, we did a bunch of recommendations and many other um, components. But um, some of the very concrete measures that we hope get included is first, that states promote full legal prohibition against all forms of discrimination against women, including gender-based violence in relation to all transnational corporations and other business enterprises activity not only in employment practices, but in all of the practices we've been discussing here, in accordance with the provisions of international human rights instruments, including but not limited to CEDAW and uh, the International Compound on ESCR and ILO conventions. Um, the second measure is that, or, or recommendation, is that all appropriate measures to ensure enjoyment of human rights and the maintenance of a safe environment for women in connection with transnational corporations' activities and to prevent forced labor, forced migration, trafficking, and violence against women. Three, ensuring the rights to effective remedy for women whose human rights have been um, impaired by transnational corporations or other business activities. This relates to what my colleague Andrea was sharing. Uh, with particular attention to women who have experienced gender-based violence and attentive to the specific challenges some women can face in bringing legal actions particularly those marginalized and affected by intersectional discrimination. And finally, the establishment of national legislation requiring mandatory human rights due diligence. So this relates to the gender due diligence uh, Maria was mentioning as well, uh, which ensures the full and active participation of women. For example, when we talk about consultations with local communities or any relevant consultations, uh, before an investment or uh, uh, development project on the ground or any type of, of corporate activity, um, women should be at least represented in equal propor proportion as men in, the, in any consultation, decision making or remedial processes. 
So that's the component related to participation of women in these spaces, and we think it's essential to, uh, to what needs to be promoted in the treaty. So I'm going to leave it there for now. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Fernanda. And Ina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's great. I think that uh, we don't want to have you waiting more, Luis, but uh, we didn't also want to have you last. But it was important for you, I think. Uh, first of all, thank you again for, for waiting, but it was important for you to listen, I think, the different perspectives and, you know, the, the rationale that is taking this group, uh, joining the process of the, of the binding treaty. Ah, sorry. No, just, just to say, reiterate, uh, first of <coughs> all, thanking you on behalf of the group that you took the time to come here. Uh, it was intentional to have you last so that you could hear the different uh, perspectives and also the, the rationale for this group of feminist and women's rights organizations to join the process for a binding treaty. So, um, of course, reactions from what you have heard, but also we would like to know more, you know, uh, about what's going on with the binding treaty process. Okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, hello everyone and thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I'm very happy that I have been part of this, uh, of listening to these very uh, important um, expositions of how um, we need to address some of the main issues in the legally binding instrument. Um, like, I don't know if it is already one year ago that we, we were in the same a panel in the same discussion with Fernanda and uh, one of the elements I forgot to, to mention was actually that uh, one of the main issues that uh, we have heard in different uh, in different occasions is to put to say something about uh, the, the situation of women regarding transnational corporations and transnational power and it was really uh, um, uh, a, a mistake from my side because um, taking into account that the president, the chairperson of this working group is a woman, is a woman, <laughs> is a woman uh, uh, my former ambassador, Ambassador Espinosa, she, she was very cautious about that issue and she was very aware and about the need to have something in, in the legally binding instrument. So um, the first thing we, I can tell you, I can share with you is that in, in any kind of proposal we consider that we need to put this gender dimension to put attention to women's uh, interest and to, to the kind of topics that you have uh, shared with us to, today. That is something that, uh, at the end of the day, I must be sincere with you as well. Um, the, the final version of, of this document will not depend only on Ecuador, but it will depend on how we craft the document together. And in this way, uh, I, I can share with you that um, we are working as, as, as Ecuador in drafting already something, drafting already a first version, let's say, of um, a, a document of elements that will be presented in October. Our purpose, at least theoretically at this moment, is to have this document beforehand, the October session. What we, what we don't want is to come to the October session and to present the document for the first time and then we know what we are going to listen. Country saying, sorry, this is the first time I have this document, so I have to send it to Capitol, so that's it. And Monday, that's it. It's finished. Okay? So our purpose is to have something in advance, enough in advance, in order to let people know the document, to test the document, to test the proposals, and then to know if they are, uh, to some extent, uh, fine with what we are going to, to, to produce. Uh, how we are producing this document so far? We are uh, working on the basis of what you have uh, said, Fernanda, the, the, the many contributions we had, not only in the second session, but also in the first session. We ha if, we, if we put them together, we have around 100 or 120 contributions, plus the debates we had in the two first sessions, mm -hmm. plus like 250 consultations, debates, events in which we have been participating not only in Geneva but in other parts of the world as well, uh, where we have had this kind of, of, of contact with different sectors of, of uh, the population which have uh, shared with us the many different aspects they consider need to be addressed in a, a legally binding instrument. 
when you, I listen to you, the same perspective or th some concerns that are quite similar come from, for example, from the, the, the indigenous po uh, people. Yes, so they have told us, pay attention to us, please don't forget us. Um, uh, trade unionists, they have also said, look, we need to have something on our behalf there. Uh, I may, may s must say as well, uh, uh, sincerely speaking, this will not be the panacea. Uh, this will not solve all the problems in, in the world. We would like to, to, to have something like that. I, it's not the case in reality. But in any case, I think that we have, as, as, as Maria said, a, a hope, the hope, the opportunity to do something, to fill a gap that is there. What you have said is, has one reason. There is a gap in the international um, uh, framework of uh, human rights instruments. There is no instrument, legally binding instrument, mm. regarding how to control a little bit transnational corporations. We think that our contribution will not solve the problem of unba the unbalanced situation, the unbalanced re relationship within, between transnational corporations and the rest of the international actors. It will only contribute to us to some extent because they will have always more power. What you said, I, I'm, I'm shocked. I didn't know that that the transnational corporations have uh, are, are like 70, have 73 percent of, of the economic power Indeed. in the world, while countries have only 37 percent. So that is really shocking. It is not new. In 1972, uh, President of Chile, Salvador Allende already gave a, a voice of alert and said, look, pay attention to transnational corporations. And actually, we have uh, been discussing about this like 50 years and nothing has happened so far. Some people will say, well, the guiding principles. Yes, the guiding principles are a good tool, but they are not enough. And I have heard here, and not only here, but also upstairs in room 20 just a few minutes ago, uh, that voluntary approaches, are unfortunately, are not enough to address one of the main problems we have. Mm -hmm. How to compensate victims, how to allow victims to go to a judge or to have some kind of, of compensation, of reparation to the damages caused to them. If you have more doubts, apart from the, the examples we have heard now, just think about the Chevron Texaco case in Ecuador, mm -hmm. and then you will see how even having a, a, a last instance uh, sentence, a last instance decision in a country, it is not enough to put a transnational corporation in, in, in a position to compensate the victims of the damages caused by that, that company. So these are the kind of things that we, we need to think. Now, coming back to specifically women, we have heard this, what you have said now, but this is not the first time I, I heard that. And evidence shows that if there is a group of people who are more uh, dramatically more uh, in danger when we have this kind of, 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 of violations of human rights by, by co the corporate power, it's women. Because women are in, 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 in our countries, at least in my country in Ecuador, I, I felt that um, some of the stories I have heard may apply to women in my country. Because when you have people working in, in, in the, um, uh, as peasants, working in, in, in rural areas, it's basically women who are in charge of all the activities. They are the, 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 the heart of the activities. And that is something undeniable. And it's not only in Ecuador, in Guatemala, in Mexico. It happens also in Asia, in Africa. Um, I, I think this is a reality, and we need to pay more attention, because women are more vulnerable. We, we like to say a lot of nice things in, the, in Room 20, but uh, I think that one of the ways in which to put those nice things in, in practice should be reflecting something in a legally binding instrument. I hope, I hope that at the end of the day, those who are not necessarily in, in favor of this legally binding instrument, at the end of the day, will be coherent with, with the discourses, the, the, the speeches they, they provide in Room 20, and will say, look, we really need to do something like this, because there are gaps, there is impu impunity, we need to do something about this. And one of the ways is addressing all the issues you have mentioned here in such a way that internationally we may have something to allow people, to allow victims, to allow women to say, look, now I have a, 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 an instrument to use it and to go to the judge, to go to any kind of mechanism we can think about it. I cannot go to the details because I would, wouldn't like to prejudge the, the result or the, the debates that we will have later on 
when, when dealing exactly with the specifics of the, the proposal we are going to make. But in any case, uh, let, me, let me tell you that all the issues you have told us, you have shared with us, uh, are very well uh, taken into account. And if this is not the case when you see the document uh, produced by Ecuador, the proposal by Ecuador, please let us know. That is the way in which we consider we can uh, enrich the document. So um, my invitation for you will be uh, if you have more specific proposals, for example, proposals like you, the, the guiding instrument, the binding, binding instrument should have a paragraph saying this, we will be more than happy to have that in order to better reflect your interests there. What will happen at the end of the day, it's not only uh, the decision of Ecuador, but what I can tell you is that at this point we are very ambitious. We, we invite everybody to be very ambitious with the text. We know that after a negotiation, the text keeps in, in the 30 percent, 40 percent of what it was uh, pre uh, presented at the very beginning. But in any case, I think that it's good to be ambitious at this moment and to try to, to, to go uh, to the highest level possible. And finally, um, I would like to, to, to call to your attention something that you have mentioned about corporate power. Uh, like 15 days ago, and there was a, new, uh, a news in the newspaper saying that um, the, the, the Office of the Human Rights um, uh, High Commissioner uh, signed an agreement with Microsoft for $5 million in order to, uh, to, 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 to do some kind of joint work regarding business and, and human rights, but basically and mainly focused in the, in the implementation of the guiding principles. In principle, I think it's fine, but I'm really worried about that. We said it uh, after the, the, um, the presentation of the report of the High Commissioner, we said it in, in Room 20, that we're worried because the same company, or at least the same people involved with Microsoft, it's Bill Gates, they, they had already done something in the WHO. They have this foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates, and they, they uh, through this, this uh, foundation, they are now more or less the, the, the ones who decide the price of vaccines in the world for all the, the, the countries, especially developing countries. So I'm really sorry, I'm really worried that if they come to the human rights field, they may have a, an approach that is basically uh, the approach of a company. Companies don't have, uh, uh, they only have to justify how they can do more profits. If they come to human rights, I'm really worried because first, perhaps they are paying for the silence of those who must say something against violations of human rights, and perhaps Microsoft is opening a gate to say, look, if you pay five millions, if you pay uh, 20 millions, saying that this is uh, some kind of uh, cooperation for any kind of project, perhaps nobody will say anything. We have seen this in countries, if not just pay attention to, to who are the the constructors of the who are the ones who have paid some of the rooms here in the in the Palais de Nation and think if they are uh, if they are criticized in room 20 so we are worried about that and we are also worried because when you have this kind of experiences such such uh, the one in in the in the WHO finally the the Microsoft or Bill and Melinda Gates will take in charge something that is of public interest and we consider that we need to pay attention to that. I hope you, as civil society, will, will, will be very aware of that, and hopefully we will pay attention to what the High Commissioner is doing. I, I trust in, in the, the High Commissioner's uh, behavior. I think he is doing it in good faith, but I cannot trust in the, in the corporate, corporate sector, I, I may say, because their, their, their objective is to have, uh, to have uh, profits, and uh, it's not the same as to have uh, human rights as the focus of your activity. So this is what I can share with you, but uh, of course, if you, you want me to, to uh, do anything else, I'm here for you. Thank you. No, and, and, and that was great, uh, because it's glad to hear, you know, states talking about <laughs> you know, corporate sector like that and not hearing it from a human rights organization. <laughs> so thank you for that. And, and uh, we know that there is a, a session going next week about especially, you know, that uh, with the Civicus and Microsoft mm -hmm. and there's going to be a panel and so a bunch okay. of us will be around. So okay. I think it's there is an opportunity okay. to, to really talk about that. So... Um, 
Um, also talking about specific recommendations, as you said, and being ambitious. Last time, this group uh, presented a, a statement, and one of our recommendations was that for the session uh, the, uh, in October, if we could have a roundtable, a formal roundtable on women and, and corporate mm -hmm. power. So that could be a very specific recommendation that we, we could have. But uh, we have 15 minutes uh, before, and we would like to hear from, from the floor. Um, I'm sorry that, uh, you know, we always try to, to have uh, interaction, but um, uh, I see a lot of young people, and I know who is, might be responsible, our colleague, fellow Jim from AWIT. <laughs> I'm glad to see a lot of young people also in the room. Uh, if there are questions, comments, you can also ask, what is the treaty? What is this binding treaty? I don't know. I have never heard about it. <laughs> what is this that you are talking about? <laughs> Gracias. Eh, digamos que en estos últimos días hemos venido pensando eh, sobre cómo desarrollar una perspectiva, una aproximación de género que aporte al tratado, pero que no se contenga únicamente en ciertos aspectos específicos de las violaciones, sino que contenga los muchos elementos de género que pueden estar vinculados al tratado. Digamos que yo los podría en principio separar en dos grandes grupos y uno, el primero de ellos es relacionado con las violaciones de derechos humanos que tienen un efecto acentuado en las mujeres y eso lo estamos viendo nosotros en todos los niveles, lo podemos encontrar eh, a nivel medioambiental, lo podemos encontrar en las condiciones salariales y de trabajo, lo podemos encontrar en la financiación de las multinacionales a grupos paramilitares y guerrillas, entonces es la actividad militar, entonces son muchos enfoques que necesitan cada uno una disciplina al interior de género y que yo lo reúno digamos que dentro de las violaciones que tienen un efecto acentuado sobre las mujeres y sobre otros, otras minorías. Eh, y otro grupo igualmente importante que yo considero tiene que ver con los cambios de fondo que deben gestarse y que al, al interior del sistema económico para no perpetuar las dinámicas que fueron creadas desde el siglo XIX con el crecimiento económico y que lo que está haciendo la globalización es ampliarlas en, en un margen mucho más, 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 más considerable. ¿Qué es lo que sucede? Que existen ciertas prácticas corporativas que no son ni siquiera consideradas como violaciones. Entonces, ¿por qué? Porque sencillamente se fueron normalizando desde el siglo XIX cuando se tenía la idea y la concepción de que el hombre era el que proveía todos los recursos para la familia y era la, la, la cabeza de hogar. Entonces, a mí me parece muy importante y no he visto el suficiente debate en el marco del tratado sobre cómo desarrollar una iniciativa paralela que no solamente tenga en cuenta las violaciones acentuadas de derechos humanos, sino que se desarrolle tal vez un protocolo alternativo para poder luchar con las prácticas que perpetúan de cierta forma la dominación. Muchas gracias. Gracias. tenido un nudo 
hemos amarrado un nudo entre la violencia en el trabajo, la violencia en el hogar y la violencia que se genera por falta de trabajo. Porque en una pareja en una, en una, o una persona que tiene recursos, natura, recursos económicos, es obvio que si afrenta la violencia, pues puede ser autodeterminado y puede salir del hogar si tiene una ocupación. Si no tiene un trabajo muchas veces, se calla y sufre en silencio. Entonces es importante, y en Europa, en Italia en particular, hay un tas, una tasa de desocupación muy alta. A nivel nacional tenemos una tasa de ocupación del 47%. Y las mujeres inmigrantes, las mujeres que migran y viven, generalmente tienen una tasa de ocupación un poquito mayor, aunque si en sectores productivos muy marginales, trabajos domésticos, en agricultura, servicios. Entonces es importante, y nosotros en el plan nacional y a nivel internacional decimos que tenemos que tener en cuenta el tema de la violencia y el respeto de los derechos de las mujeres pasan a través de la autonomía económica y de la posibilidad de tener un empleo. Eso es fundamental tenerlo en cuenta. De lo contrario, se le victimizan a las mujeres y se le ven como personas solo víctimas de protección, de tutela. Y ese es un, un, un pensamiento muy paternalista hacia las mujeres. Las mujeres son capaces, se forman, estudian. Y cuando tienen las oportunidades y las justas oportunidades, pues muchas veces son y llegan a roles muy altos. ¿no? Pero a veces hay que también ahí cardinar lógicas que las estudien. Así que hay que tener en cuenta 360 grados y uno de los elementos fundamentales es tener una cultura para eliminar los prejuicios, que muchas veces los prejuicios son los que encardinan eh, y se eh, encancrenan en la cultura, ¿no? Es importante. Y en eso pues es fundamental trabajar con los jóvenes. Eh, y yo creo que se tiene que tener en cuenta también esos aspectos. Thank you. My name is Lila Pukui, and uh, I come from Liberia, where we have a female president, actually the first female president in Africa. Um, listening to the deliberations, I just like to add that it's important to educate women on the values of knowing your rights. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of women who we're speaking from the corporate setting, and we're also talking about indigenous women. Uh, just the ability to be able to speak out about issues confronting them mm. in itself is a challenge. There will be issues, and these issues are looked at as taboo, and they are not supposed to be spoken of. One of the biggest problems that we experience in the country I come from is usually rape. Uh, rape against women, rape against younger women, minors, little babies, and all of that. And the same as a stigma, Uh, compared to the, the, the victims uh, seen as being victimized, they've been seen as being stigmatized. So to have the ability to stand up and even want to attest or confront these situations in itself is a challenge. Whatever we're doing, let's consider informing women, let's consider educating them on the power in them speaking out. I could sit here all day, listen, and we have the conference. And until I open my mouth and speak out, my perspective will never be heard. The issues will not be raised. So rural women, indigenous women, should be encouraged to speak out as much as those in corporate settings are speaking out as well. Thank you. OK. Quieren decir algo final? No? Okay. Yes. Um, now I just want to, I have the feeling it feels, I mean, we all feel it, this conversation is limited because we are trying to contribute to the process of, you know, creating or, or a legally binding treaty or instruments regarding, you know, corporations and human rights. But, I mean, we could be sitting here for months talking about gender inequality you know, mm -hmm. and violence against women. So that is why we were focusing on very specific 
issues and very specific experiences because I, I feel that um, we need to be looking at some things that could be potentially included in the conversations of uh, re regarding the treaty. Uh, and that's why I'm, I mean, from where I come and the work I do, I could be hours debating with you about, you know, power structures within corporations. I come from a human rights organization, don't get me wrong, but we analyze this all the time. And even we could just go up and see the her story, beautiful thing that is put uh, uh, in the lobby of the Ballet de Nacion. And it's, it's very funny to see how all male general secretaries comment about her story in the United Nations, which is sarcastic to say the least. And uh, I mean, we could be debating about how women are not included or, you know, disempowered or all these power dynamic, dynamics in different uh, spheres and issues and experiences. Uh, but we were just, I mean, trying to concentrate on this particular topic, <laughs> but just not, not to ignore what we're, well, I guess, somehow feeling. And our, our colleague from Liberia was being very vocal about it that we should be probably in other spaces continue talking about these things uh, aside of the treaty debate in particular. Mm -hmm. but so just my two cents. Thank you. Good. Okay. Just, no, my See. Again. Well, well, again, um, I, I understand that, uh, well, I understood that perhaps you were um, aware of the of the proposal of legally binding instrument, but um, and. I think that uh, it's good for you to know a little bit of the beginning of this proposal. In 2014, in the Human Rights Council, Ecuador and South Africa presented um, a resolution uh, in order to uh, begin the negotiation on the elaboration of a legally binding instrument on transnational corporations and human rights. Uh, the idea was to, to have or to create, to elaborate uh, a, a treaty in the future in order to balance what I told already, the unbalanced situation between uh, companies or corporations which are protected by the investment treaties, trade treaties, uh, why victims don't have protection. That was one of the main purposes of this initiative. Um, fortunately, the resolution was adopted, even by both. Uh, which is one of the democratic uh, proceedings in, in, in the Human Rights Council, and it was adopted, and the first step was to create an intergovernmental open-ended working group in order to, uh, in, in charge of the elaboration of this legally binding instrument. Uh, this working group, which is intergovernmental, uh, was uh, began their, uh, uh, its activities in 2015. The first session was in July 2015, the second session was in October 2016, and the third session is this October, October 2017. The main challenge for the third session is that the chairperson of this working group, which is so far um, um, the former ambassador of Ecuador here in Geneva, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, has to deliver a document of elements in order to begin substantive negotiations in October 2017. Perhaps this will provide you with an idea of what we were talking about, mm -hmm. because um, after listening to the questions, I understand that uh, it, perhaps it was not so clear uh, why we are talking about the, the, the legally binding instrument and what is the legally binding instrument. So the idea should be to, to, compi uh, co uh, to, to, to um, gather all these kind of, of comments that we have heard here and in other discussions as well, in order to have something reflected in the text of the legally binding instrument. Uh, I was saying perhaps n not all of it will be reflected in the final version, which we don't know how long will it take to, 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 to negotiate, but in any case, at this very st first stage, we need to be very ambitious and to try to, to collect all these this, uh, comments in order to, to put them in this, in this written proposal. And then let's see how the negotiation evolves and hopefully we will have to do something at the end of the day in the final version of this proposal that Ecuador and South Africa are, are, are leading so far. So this, to just to, to provide no, a context, perhaps you. it was better to do it before, thank but you very well, much. okay, thank you. So Ina? I also would like to respond to some things that were said, and especially 
your comment because I've been thinking from a feminist perspective, listening to you on the interconnectedness of mm -hmm. issues and the intersectionality that we identify from a feminist perspective. And I didn't mention it in my present, original presentation for a shortage of time, but uh, we know that corporate human rights violations, they don't only uh, directly uh, violate women's human rights and increase gender violence, <coughs> but also lead to changes in society that increase women's um, vulnerability and strength in patriarchy and racism mm -hmm. and class divisions and poverty and so on. And um, just having in mind how those issues are interconnected in how they operate on the ground, but also in the importance of us informing each other about the different struggles that we are engaging in from feminist perspectives and seeing to what extent you know, corporate impunity and sexual and reproductive rights and the struggle um, to end sexual violence and rape, to what extent they're in interconnected and how we can be stronger together. Um, and um, I was asked before about the strategy. Um, <laughs> so one of the strategies is solidarity. And that's, that's the point I was hoping to yeah. make, so thank you. Uh, so, so thank you everyone. So in the in the couple of minutes uh, that we have, I think that uh, well, you know the the issue, you know the title, uh, it's women challenging corporate power, but it led us to unveil all these inequalities and disparities, you know, because all this impact of the transnational doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It happens in a you know, in situations where the development model that today is, you know, applied is a development model that allows for these inequalities to be perpetuated. There's a lot of evidence here in the room, but a lot of evidence, of course, outside this room too. There are elements that at least you can take uh, from this discussion, but elements that for sure we can continue um, be sending to you about, you know, what would be the feminist perspective of this. And for sure, we would like to see how to realize that round table on women and, and corporate power, on women and the binding treaty, uh, we, because we will be back in October. I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this event, Poder, FIDH, uh, who um, uh, all, uh, have also, uh, you know, conceptualized this panel, Wilf, Patricia, who has uh, been um, taking care of Maria's daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Um, uh, but also helped us to conceptualize and make sure that we have, you know, a perspective uh, that incorporates also the perspective of uh, peace and freedom. RIDH, if you can stand up and, and please, please, you have also contributed into this. Um, my colleague Awid, uh, fellow Jean, is not here. Uh, and of course, Luis, for. Um, I know it's it's difficult sometimes to be in a room full of feminists, <laughs> angry feminists. We have been in difficult processes. We know how uh, it was during the Sustainable Development Goals when people wanted to get rid of the goal number five, but we made it. So we are ready okay. for a fight if it's needed. Uh, so and, and thank you. And for sure, the strategy now is to educate, educate on the treaty for sure to make sure that people know on the ground what this is and how it's connected to their issues and to do a lot of advocacy. So by October, we uh, we have, you know, more a more consensuated um, language for okay. it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hola, we need a picture and we need to